Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see those in, in house today, even on a rainy day and only 15% capacity, but um, we have less than that. So those that are watching online, we do have room. So get in your car, drive here real fast. No, that's like, um, I just want to begin by reading it. Uh, uh, I guess a lot of times we read this on Sunday mornings, but it's, it's such a good passage from Psalm 100. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So um, here we can, we can shout, we can jump up and down, dance, clap, you know, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. So you at home enter the living room with thanksgiving and praise. Get ready to shout in the house, gather everybody around and get ready because we're going to we're going to sing together and lift up the name of of Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can be together. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to this place and just honor your name through through our singing, through our prayers, through the ministry of your word, through through everything that we say and do that, God, that you would be glorified, that you would be uplifted today. For, for those that are here and for those that are, that are watching at home. Bless you, Lord. Amen. I just love the line in the second song that says, Our confidence is in your faithfulness. <laughs> what a beautiful line that is. I've served the Lord Jesus since 1978. And I know I don't look that old. But I want to tell you, He has been faithful every step of the way. Doesn't mean that it's all been easy. We life like everybody else. We've had uh, difficulties and, and trials and you know loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord and all of those things. But God is always, always faithful. He has met our needs all the time. And even now, as we get ready to take up the 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 offering today, we do that knowing that He is, is faithful. And so, good morning. Once again, you can be seated, guys. You don't want to. You guys want to keep worshiping? Is that it? <laughs> You're not sure. Um, so, welcome everybody that's here, and welcome to those that are that are watching online to Impact Church Toronto. And we really are. We're, we're excited that we can have people in the house, right? Whether it's fifteen percent or a hundred percent, that will come again. But we are excited and happy to have people in-house and we're excited and happy to have you watching us online and we just believe that God has something exciting for every one of us. Every time we meet, we believe that God has something exciting and new and fresh because it's a living hope, isn't that right? First Peter and it's a living hope that we have and every time we gather there's something good. So so welcome and uh, before we, we go on to some video announcements and in a moment, and the message we want to take up, receive the, the tithes and the offerings. And, you know, there's a question that people do ask at times. Where, you know, when I give, where does my money go, go to? Uh, when I give, where does it go? And the answer to that question is actually, it is actually fairly simple, that your money goes into furthering the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter whether it's going to world missions or a new camera. We bought a new camera. It's going to be up next week. I'm going to look slimmer. <laughs> Just, I'm going to look good with that new camera, right? It doesn't matter whether it's world missions, whether it's a new camera, a new microphone for the worship team, an outreach program. It doesn't matter. Or the electric bill. It all goes towards the furthering of the kingdom of God in the local church. And so we just appreciate uh, the giving that is given into the kingdom of God. And Luke, or not Luke, but 2 Corinthians 9, 10 and 11 says this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion 
And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So Paul is saying that your gift is, is a blessing to, to other peoples, that it causes them to give thanksgiving to God. And not only does God promise us um, a return and a blessing to us as we give, but it is a blessing to those that also receive in the furthering of the kingdom, which results in thanksgiving to Him. So when we give today, we realize that, that we have a greater purpose that we're involved in. It doesn't seem really earth-shaking <laughs> that we pay the electric bill, but it's all furthering the kingdom of God. Amen? And that's exciting. And when we see, you know, we had uh, Ben Koshi, his father is Pastor Koshi in, in India, and we have been able to, you know, pray for them and support in different ways. And, and, and just him talking about how God has ministered in that church. And so we see the, the tremendous results that take place in places like Haiti as well. And so we're so thankful for that. And so, Lord, we are thankful that we are able to give in to the furthering of the kingdom today, of, of reaching people with the good news of the gospel, whether it's for us here in our own um, local uh, city, in our own community, or whether it's, it's, it's a city in India or in Haiti or uh, wherever else it may be that we've supported that, that it is reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we just thank you, O oh God. And we pray that, that, Father, as we give, that, Lord, there would be, it's like a thank offering unto you for the goodness and your faithfulness and that many people will recognize, will recognize the blessing that comes from different churches that are reaching out. And Lord, it says that they will bring thanks to you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And we thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Of course, if you're in-house, there's we're not passing buckets around, but we have giving stations at the back. And with this video announcement, those online will be able to see how, how to participate in giving. Good morning, and welcome to Impact Church Toronto. We are so glad that you're joining with us today. If you're new, we would like to extend a special welcome to you. For us, this is so much more than just a Sunday morning service, and we want you to know that there's a place for you here at Impact. The best way to get connected is head over to our Connect card on our website, impactto.ca slash connect, and fill out as much information as you're willing to. We're not going to bother you. We just want to send you a small token and appreciation for joining with us. And now, here's a little bit of what's happening during the week here at Impact. We would love for you to connect with us, and there are a few ways you can connect as part of our community. The first is participating in our chat window, which is open right now. We would love to hear from you. Also, you can join our Connect group every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Connect is a great way to get to know people from our community better, especially in times such as these. On Thursdays at 7.30 a.m., you can join us on Zoom for a prayer that lasts about half an hour or you can join us at 7 p.m. in the church for a small prayer. We would love for you to join us wherever you can. If you have been enjoying our online experience, we would love it if you took a second right now to share on whatever social media platform you use so that more people can hear the life-changing message of Jesus. Great, that's good. How many people got to see the email with the link to that song, Talking to Jesus, that we sent out? Was that, what, Doug, did you like that, Douglas? Wasn't that a great song? Oh, I, I thought it was very inspiring, very emotional. Man, I think I've listened it to like four or five times since then. So, um, so please respond or, you know, look at your emails. We do send out some good stuff once in a while. All right. So uh, it keeps you connected and you know what's, what's going on. Uh, with the and especially on Thursdays, just want you to know that we do send out. That's our day of prayer, and we send out an email with a directive for that day, so that we as a church we're all praying into the same thing for that day. All right. So remember, on Thursday mornings, I usually get it done right after our Zoom prayer meeting, and put it on about eight eight fifteen, and so you can uh, receive your email and and um, pray into those things. 
Well, we're in a series on, on resurrection. It changes everything. And, you know, we've been talking that how uh, we talk about the resurrection on Easter Sunday, but very seldom talk much more about it. But it is so important. It is uh, it's so important that we understand the implications that the resurrection has for us right, right now. I, I, I like the song that we were singing that it says that, you know, when, when my strength is leaving and, you know, that my time has come that we know it's talking about that I will be raised to new life, that there is life after death, and the resurrection of Jesus lets us know that, that he was the first fruits, but that all of us that are in him will also be raised to life. But you see, so many of us, we think of the resurrection of something that only has implications for when I die, and that's not true. It has implications for right now. And I want to talk about resurrection and, and purpose. You know, today, again, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's, it's not Easter Sunday, uh, but we actually celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every Sunday that we come here. Whether we actually specifically talk about it or not, the only reason that we actually come here on a Sunday to worship is because he rose from the dead. Right? The reason why the Jewish Sabbath, I mean, they're still on a Saturday from Friday night, you know, right up through till, till Saturday evening, but, but the resurrection happened on Sunday morning, and those disciples, just think about it, they changed their whole, their day that they worship. And they changed it to Sunday. The first day of the week, they came together and they celebrated together. And so, whether we talk about it or not, the reason we are here this morning is because Jesus has risen from the dead. I mean, if he didn't rise from the dead, there's no point anyway. <laughs> and he's not the Son of God, and so what's, what's the point? Just to have some kind of uh, you know, nice teaching? No, the fact is, is that we do have his amazing teaching. We do have the example of his life and the miracles that he did, but that he has also empowered us to continue on doing what he was doing. That's, that's purpose. That's, that's pretty awesome stuff. And so I want to talk to you today about that, about resurrection and purpose. And I, w I was going to show a, uh, a trailer of a movie, and I think I did show it a few years ago. And it's about Lee Strobel, and it's, uh, the, the movie was called A Case for Christ. We're, we're not showing it because, I don't know if you realize this, but when we're online on YouTube... If you play something that you don't have copyright for, they'll, they'll take your, you know, they'll just shut you down right away, and you may not get on for a few weeks. So we thought we wouldn't, uh, put, even though it's just a two and a half minute trailer of the movie, I'd encourage you if you get a chance to, to watch the movie. But what this is all about is Lee Strobel was, um, is, is an author today um, and, and a teacher. He was an atheist that became a Christian. He is a, uh, a former award winning Chicago Tribune and best-selling author of more than 25 books. And again, one of them was the book, The Case for Christ. Another one is his book, The Case for Grace, when he won the 2016 Nonfiction Book of the Year with the Evangelical uh, Publishers, uh, Evangelical Christian Publishers Association, something like that. But he was an atheist, and the, 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 the movie shows his, where, how he became a, uh, became a follower and became a Christian. And what it is, is that we, we, we find out that his wife becomes a Christian through a very you know, dramatic episode, and she's beginning to change, obviously. Her, her worldview is definitely changing because she's now a Christian. She knows that Christ has been risen from the dead. He's alive. He wasn't just a, a, a nice moral teacher that died, and, and that was it. He died for a cause, and we don't have to think about it anymore. No, her life was changing. So he came to real, and he, he, he worked with somebody that was a Christian, and the person said, listen, if you can disprove the resurrection of Jesus, then there is no Christianity. So as an investigative reporter, he decided that's what I'm going to do. I mean, and he really, he traveled, he traveled and talked to, you know, uh, d different to ministers and from different uh, Christian denominations. He talked to scholars, he talked to atheists, he talked to so many people about, about the, the, the historic event of the resurrection. 
And when it was all said and done, when you watch this movie, you find out that he had to come to the realization that the resurrection of Jesus was absolutely true. And because of that, it changed everything for him. It changed his life completely. As somebody that was an atheist to now realizing that this Jesus really did rise from the dead, he is the Son of God, and now he received purpose. And he is a, uh, he, he is a professor in a, in, a, in a Bible college. As I said, he's written over 25 books, and he's training people for ministry to go do what he is doing now. And we see that everything changed in his life because of, of purpose when he came to the, or because of the resurrection, and he came to understand that it, uh, the truth of it had to affect his life and his worldview. So he wanted to share his faith and to equip others to do the same. Now, the thing is, is we may not write 25 books. And, and have a purpose, a mission that is, um, uh, you know, like his and, and be a professor or anything like that. But every one of us is called to the purpose of being a witness for him in our, in our lives. And, and even it may not be as dramatic as, uh, you know, as, as, as his testimony was, but the, re- the resurrection is a present reality today. And as we discussed last, last Sunday, which was Easter, that it's a vital truth of the Christian faith. And it may be overstating it, but again, without the resurrection, we don't have Christianity. 1 Peter 1.3, as we mentioned earlier, Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, if, if, if that's true, that he's given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection, then the opposite would be true if he didn't resurrect. There wouldn't be new birth, and I wouldn't have living hope, but I can tell you, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure with most of you here today, you could come up here and speak into the mic and say, I know I have new birth, and I know that I have a living hope. I experience Jesus each and every day in my life. Right? How many hands can go up in here? Yeah, I'm sure. See, so Romans 8, 11 also says, and if the Spirit, and we talked about this a little bit last week, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. What an amazing thing that is, that the reason I have new birth is because I have been regenerated with the Holy Spirit. He has come into my life and given me new life. What a powerful change has taken place to all those that put their faith, put their trust, their belief in Jesus Christ. In that we have been regenerated by the same Holy Spirit that actually raised Jesus from the dead. I mean, you, you, you've got to sometimes just meditate on the Scriptures and realize what the Scriptures are actually saying. Because when you read that, then you go, man, sometimes I'm not walking in that experience and I, I, I need to meditate on that because that's the experience we should be walking in. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. Amazing. So through the Holy Spirit, we have new power. Romans 6 tells us that that we are alive with Christ and that power enables us to walk in newness of life. So because of the resurrection, we have new life, we have a new birth, and we have new power. We have the Holy Spirit that actually lives and dwells in us. So what? (laughs) Why? What's the purpose of that? Why, why Why has Jesus poured out His Holy Spirit? Why did He pour out the Holy Spirit on Pentecost to the church? Why, why is it that, that the Holy Spirit that raised Him from the dead dwells in us? What's the purpose? Well, I'm glad you asked. How many were asking that question? Some of you, all right. We're going to look at a couple of passages to help us understand the purpose of this new life and this power by the Holy Spirit that, that lives in Within us. Surprisingly, there's, there's few recorded words of, of Jesus after his resurrection. We don't have a lot of what he said after his resurrection. So, therefore, 
I mean, we've got a lot of stuff that he said before he died, but very few after he, after he died. So therefore, the things that he did say after he died and rose again has to be very, very important. Do you agree with that? Right. So we're going to look at just a couple of verses and look at it. First one is John 20, 21. And Jesus meets his disciples and he says to them again, Jesus said, peace be with you. It seemed like after his resurrection, every time he saw them, he said, peace be with you. And um, I don't know if it's because they were afraid, <laughs> but uh, that, that could have been part of it. I mean, listen, if somebody just rose from the dead and you saw him, you'd be a little, wow, right? But anyway, he says, peace, it's okay. And then listen to what he says. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Wow, what a powerful statement it must have been to those disciples. Maybe not even sure at that moment what it meant. I don't know if he said that on, 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 on the first Sunday that he rose, the second Sunday, or whether it was just before he ascended. But, um, and it goes on, then Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And I'm going to read through Matthew 28 in a moment, but I just want to read these first, uh, the, the last verses of this chapter first. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, once once this, this next shutdown is over, we, have more, we need to have a water baptism. Right? If you're here and you need to be water baptized, let me know. If you're watching online, let me know where you got to set that up. And then the last part of this says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of, of the age. And so Matthew is recording the story of Jesus' resurrection, first of all. And he comes to the, you know, the, 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 this last part and he gives them some marching orders. So let's jump back now to verse 1 through verse 10 of Matthew 28. And it says, after, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Might as well read the other verses here. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they came, they gave the soldiers the large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and says, All authority, go and make disciples of all nations. So the first Sunday after his death, we see that those, those tremendous words, He is not here, He has risen. In Matthew chapter 28, he is recounting, first of all, the resurrection of Jesus, and then he closes with what we call the Great Commission. That it's commission, just command. This, th this was not, a, oh, by the way, guys, uh, before I leave, I just want you to know, you should tell people about that, that this happened. This is a command. 
guys, <laughs> I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. And what we read here in the closing verses of Matthew 28 is, of course, Jesus given this command, giving these instructions, that he is giving the marching orders for the church. That through all generations, this is what you should be doing with the fact that I rose from the dead. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's what he's saying for all followers. This is your mission. This is your purpose, to go and make disciples of all nations. It's the proclamation of, of Jesus in all the earth. And so what we see is that Matthew connects the resurrection in this passage with the Great Commission. See, most of the time, what we do is we, we take those first 10 verses of Matthew 28 and we preach a nice Easter message that he is not here. And then we just leave that without looking at the implications and, and, and that God has some instructions. He has a command for us. But in Matthew, when we read the whole chapter, it's not that we just take a look at the first 10 verses, but don't look at the last, the, the, the last three verses to be connected with that. He is saying, because I've risen from the dead, that's why I have all authority. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. His pointing, his showing people that he was alive shows that he had the authority. He is saying, in light of who I am and what have I accomplished in my death and resurrection, this is your mission. This is your, your purpose. And we need to understand that. And when we look at a couple of different people that through Jesus' appearances, we have, first of all, we have Mary that, 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 you know, on the first Sunday when he rose, there's Mary. And we talked about this last week, but I just want to, to highlight it because in our, in our, our Zoom meeting on, on Wednesday night, we talked a little bit more of this and we prayed about this. And, and, and it, was, it was Mary stood by the tomb crying because she says, I don't know where my Savior, I don't know where they've taken him. And she turns, and Jesus is standing there, and she thinks he's the gardener, as, and it goes further on in, in, in uh, the Gospel of John, and she doesn't recognize him. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, Mary. And it's when he says her name that she understands and recognizes this is Jesus. And, and I want people to realize that the resurrected Jesus right now knows your name. He knows what you're going through. Mary stood there. She was, she was helpless, hopeless. She was depressed. She was grieving. She's crying. And before Jesus ascended as the first fruits to the Father, he stops along the way to talk to Mary that he had cast out seven devils and that he, he was saying he had changed her life and he was going to let her know, Mary, I'm alive. Isn't that awesome? He knows, exact, he knows your name and he knows exactly what you're going through and he has the answer. He's there for you. The other one that I was thinking about is, is, is Thomas. And we read the passage from John chapter 20, verse 21, where it says, says peace be with you. And, and, and he goes on and says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Well, when you read that, that's the first, that's the first Sunday. That's the day that Jesus rose. Now this is evening and the disciples are meeting because they said, go ahead of me into Galilee and Jesus is going to meet them. Well, that first Sunday night, first Sunday night service, by the way, uh, that first Sunday night, all the disciples were there, of course, not Judas, and Thomas wasn't there. Could you, and, and, you know, I always think about, just think of, of Thomas. He's not there. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, you know, he had to put the kids to bed or something. I, I don't know, right? There can be all reasons why the, he wasn't there that night. Doesn't say. But the other disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And the point is, is that in the past, see, we always talk about doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas. He didn't believe. I, I, I kind of say that that's kind of a, a, a wrong badge to put on him. Because what did they tell him? They said, we saw his scars. We, 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 we saw the, the, you know, this, the, the, the wound in his side that the spear went in. We saw those things. And what is it that Thomas says to them? Unless I see the scar nails in his hands, and could put my finger in his side, 
I'm not going to believe you. I think he's just really ticked off that he missed the, he missed the best service the church ever had. <laughs> Come on, right? And then it says, the next week, everybody is there and Thomas. <laughs> Thomas wasn't going to miss it the second week. And it says, with the doors locked, it doesn't say that Jesus walked through the door. He may have. But it says, it really actually says he just appeared. And so we are, we're going to have glorified bodies. Everybody know that? Yeah, that's good. Uh, so all of a sudden, he goes and he says, Thomas, look at my hands. Thomas, come and put your finger in my side. Jesus is so close to you, he wants you to believe. He will come to you. He will minister to you. I mean, he showed up and he specifically, with everybody else there, he pointed out Thomas because he was the one that he wanted to show himself to. Jesus, think about it. When he was on earth, we had the crowds, but he also stopped for the one. He stopped for Zacchaeus, the tax collector, right? He stopped for, for the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, the one. He stopped for the woman that reached out and touched the hem of his garment and was healed and said, who touched me? Jesus would stop for the one and he still stops for the one today. He knows Mary, he knows Thomas, and he knows your name. He knows Timothy Earl right here, <laughs> right? And so that's, that's our Savior. Now, so Matthew 28, it's recounting the resurrection of Jesus. And it is saying that, you see, Jesus wanted to show people that he was alive. And then it connects the, the great commission that we are to be out there speaking and talking and telling people and letting people know that Jesus Christ is alive. He, he has risen from the dead. And it is because he has all authority. See, listen, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he wouldn't have all authority. The fact that he rose from the dead, he has all authority. So when I step out in his name, I've got the authority of Jesus on my side. What is that authority? He defeated hell, he defeated Satan, and he defeated death. He defeated every enemy that we have as human beings, he has defeated all of it. And at the cross, even sickness, by his stripes, we are healed. So we know that, that, that he has all that authority. And it wasn't just for a few followers, or it wasn't just for a nation, but he says for all nations, all people to hear. And so before Jesus instructs them to go, he says that to, to make, and make disciples all, of all nations, he makes himself known to over 500 people. I, I, I heard Mark Clark say this on, on Instagram, and I, I don't know if it was from his message that he was preaching on Sunday, but, but he says some people say, oh, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. It was just a metaphor for if you follow his teachings of what can happen in your heart. And he said, <laughs> in his way that he does it and says, come on, these people would go and die for a metaphor? I don't think so. The reason why they were able to go and, and within several years, I mean, the known world was touched. It became, the Roman Empire became a Christian state with, with, within a, a few generations. It wasn't because it was a metaphor. It was because Jesus really, truly did rise from the dead. You know, no one, no government, no system has authority equal to Jesus. Right? So therefore, when I step out doing His will and furthering the kingdom of God, no person, no government, no system has more authority than I do in the name of Jesus. That's a pretty crazy thought, isn't it? He, he, said, he says, I have all authority, therefore go. You say, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's easier for them because, you know, hey, they, they saw him. But when we look at the evidence of the growth of the church within 30, 40, 50 years and what they accomplished, and then as your own witness, that the Holy Spirit, he, he comes along and he testifies with my spirit, that I am alive in Christ, that the Holy Spirit lives in me, 
man, we know that it's, it's absolutely true. Jesus rose from the dead and it proves that He conquered death and it proves that He has all authority or some translations say all power. And there's a saving message that, that He wants us to take to every person. And to illustrate this, I want to use the, the passage out of Acts chapter 10. This is with Peter and Cornelius. You have to understand when you get to Acts chapter 10, see, when, when, when Jesus said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, meaning when the Holy Spirit is poured out, then you'll go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He was also talking about that, that you know, it was from Jerusalem, Jews. Samaria <laughs> was half Jew, half Gentile. And then to the ends of the earth is Gentiles. To this point... Peter, to this point, had not, had, had, didn't even re- maybe realize that salvation, that this was for Gentiles as well. So we know the story that he is, he is up on a roof and he's praying and he's hungry and, and, and God shows him a vision of all these different animals coming down and God says to him, Peter, kill and eat. He says, oh no, Lord, I haven't eaten those things. Those are unclean. God says, don't call anything I've made unclean. What he's doing is he is setting him up for what he's calling Peter to do. And in the meantime, there's a centurion named Cornelius. He's a Gentile, but he's a God-fearing man. And he's always praying, and he's giving to the poor. And God wants to reveal to him that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one he's waiting for. And so while he's in prayer, God speaks to him and says, send for this guy Peter at Straight Street that he can come and talk to you. So he does. And so while Peter is having that vision, at that time, these two messengers from Cornelius are banging at the front door. And he comes down, what is it you want from me? Come and talk to Cornelius, a Gentile. While we understand the vision that Peter just had, he's not going to say, no, I'm not going to go talk to a Gentile, they're unclean. He says, I am going to go and I'm going to talk to this this man. And so uh, Peter goes there and Cornelius has his whole family there. And Cornelius has all friends, neighbors, everybody there. And while Peter is, is, is speaking, the Holy Spirit comes and, and falls on them. And they are, every one of them is, uh, gives their life to Christ. And it says that they are water baptized. Now, look at the description that Peter gives about this to them in 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, verses 39 to 42. So this is Peter now talking to Cornelius and his household. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. (laughs) And then he says, he was not seen by, by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I mean, Peter's not living a lie here. Peter's not living a fake story. Peter is, is going about doing what he's doing because he said, I actually sat and I ate and I drank with Jesus after he had risen from the dead. And he says this, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Just as Matthew took the resurrection and connected it to the Great Commission, go and make uh, disciples of all nations, Peter is saying, I sat with the resurrected Lord, and what did He tell me to do? Go and preach to everybody. And he's saying, that's what I'm doing right now. Peter connects the resurrection with the command to go and tell people about Christ. And that's the purpose that we have from the resurrection, that he is alive. We see here as a direct result of the resurrection, Jesus is commissioning Peter. And you know what? Jesus is still commissioning people to go. Throughout church history, Jesus has been sending messengers to share the good news of salvation. Maybe not, not, maybe they haven't seen Jesus with their own eyes. I have to tell you, I have not seen Jesus physically. 
But I can tell you because I have new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me, I can tell you absolutely 100% he is alive and his Holy Spirit lives in me. So I may not have seen him that way, but I still have the same commission. I still take the same instructions of go and make disciples. Go and make disciples everywhere you go. So I wanted to go to Romans chapter 10. I know I'm jumping around, but you'll see it here. Here we go. Romans chapter 10. How about verse 14 and 15? It says, Now then, can they call on the one, or sorry, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? That is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so we know that lives are dramatically changed today because Jesus still still commissions people, still sends people. But as we're, we're said that there are people that need to hear, but somebody has to go and tell them. And so we we have to come to that place and say, will you say yes to this commissioning? I'm not, I'm not saying that, that everybody in, that can hear my voice, whether online or, or in here, that God's going to send you to the nations. He might just be sending you to the grocery store this afternoon, <laughs> right? That somebody at the grocery store needs a touch, needs a word from God. He might just be sending you to your neighbor. He might be sending you to a family friend. But will you say yes to the Great Commission that, hey, I'm going to let people know Jesus is alive. And the resurrection, I have met the risen Savior, and it changed everything. Or he changed everything. See, let's, let's read Fuller here from verse 9 of, of Romans 10. It says in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the resurrection here gives us, gives us purpose. But this passage that I looked at, and you read through where, where you know, everybody needs to hear that Jesus died. It is with, with my mouth I confess, but with my heart that I believe he was risen from the dead, that they will be saved. And so anybody that calls on the name of the Lord, but if nobody goes to tell them, how do they know to call on the name of the Lord? So this passage shows us the urgency of the purpose that God has given us. The resurrection gives us new purpose and a new mission for our lives to have, to be able to, to, to go and speak the good news of the gospel to people. Now, I started with the story of Lee Strobel. And I want to I give one other bit of the story that, that, that we see how, how if we are willing and the Holy Spirit moving in our lives makes a difference. You see, the reason his wife became a Christian is because of a dramatic episode that happened one night in a restaurant. Lee and, her, and, 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 and her, she was there with her husband, Lee, and their daughter. And while they're there, they give her some money to go over to a, a gumball machine. And they're just sitting talking. And the daughter goes over and gets a gumball machine, gets a, you know, one of those, those, I don't know if it was a jawbreaker, maybe a little smaller. And she comes back to the table and she can't talk. It's lodged in her throat. She's choking. They're freaking out. They don't know what to do. In the restaurant, there's a woman that comes over. She's a nurse. She does the Heimlich maneuver. The gumball comes out. The child is saved. This woman 
tells Lee Strobel's wife, we don't normally come to this restaurant. I am a Christian, and I know the Holy Spirit told me to come here tonight, and now I know the reason. And it was through that relationship that Lee Strobel's wife began to, to, to visit her and talk with her about the Christian faith, and then eventually going to church, she gave her life to Christ. And today, today that, uh, that little girl is also an author of Christian books, and they have a son who writes Christian books, and their whole life was changed because one woman listened to the Holy Spirit and said, I'll go and I'll do what, whatever it is you commission me to do. There's an urgency for us to, uh, because of the resurrected Lord. I mean, think about this. If, if Jesus didn't resurrect, they wouldn't, have done these, these, they wouldn't have done these things. But we just look at this passage all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Isn't that a lovely phrase? But if you for 40 days have been sitting, eating, and drinking with the risen Savior, and he says, guys, I've got all authority. Go and make disciples of all nations. You're jumping on it. <laughs> the thing is, it's no different for them than it is now because he's still alive. So we have to answer the call everywhere we go. We are witnesses of the risen Savior. That is our purpose. I want to finish with this from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the most intense or detailed chapter on bodily resurrection. Not only talking about Jesus' resurrection, but the bo like our bodily resurrection. When, I mean, I use this passage a lot. In, um, when, when, when I do funerals. Because you want to give people hope. But, but at the end of all of this, he's talking about we, we certainly have bodily, we are all going to have this future hope that we will one day, be our bodies will raise with Christ and we have that and that's, that's going to happen for sure. And we look at that and we wonder, how does, how does Paul close out a chapter like that? You would think he would say, therefore, guys, since we have such a great hope, sit back, relax, because you know God's got a great future in store for you after you die. Right? I mean, that's true. I don't have to do anything anymore after I receive Christ. I'm going to live with him. I'm going to be resurrected. But look how, look how Paul finishes it in verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. You see purpose connected to the resurrection? Not only Jesus' resurrection, but the hope of our own resurrection? Therefore, guys, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves to what? Fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. See, the resurrection and the Great Commission go together. And Jesus has given us purpose. He's given us marching orders. Individually and collectively as a local church to reach as many people with the good news of the gospel as we can. And it is simply, what is it that we preach? It gives us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What's the gospel we preach? That Jesus lived, that Jesus died on the cross, that it says that he was buried for three days and on the third day he rose again. That's our message. When we present people with the fact that Jesus lived, Jesus died, and he rose from the dead, it's up to them to make a decision about who he is and what are they going to do with it. When people are seriously confronted with who Jesus is, you've got a decision to make. Because if he really is risen from the dead, then he is the Son of God, and you better do something about it. And, and, and it's not that he wants to judge and, and just come down hard on you. He wants you to come. What, what, why did he spend 40 days meeting with his disciples? Because he wants everybody to come into a relationship with him that is one of love and mercy and grace. Amen. I'm going to call the worship team up as we, as we pray. We're going to sing another song. And, 
And I just want to say for anybody here or those that are watching online, if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, but you understand today, you know He is alive. And you say, God, I want you, I want you Lord Jesus, in my life. I want to have that, that new birth and that living hope. I want the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to come and dwell in me. All you have to do is just say, Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And I believe in my heart that you are risen from the dead. I thank you that you took my sins to the cross. I am completely forgiven. All my sins, past, present, and future, have been dealt with at the cross. And I receive that now. And I just follow you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come into my life. That's all you have to do. If you've done that online, go to our website, Impact Toronto. And we have a connect card. You can tell us about it. And we'd love to get in contact with you and, and pray, with, pray for you. But today, let's stand before we sing. And come on, let's just, uh, for those that know the Lord, for those that you know what it is to have new birth and a living hope. Come on, as we, as we even sing this song, let's say, Lord Jesus, I just, I just accept your marching orders today. God, that, 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 that I'll talk and tell people about you that you are alive. You did die on the cross, but Jesus, you rose again. You're alive today, and you want to show people your love and your goodness. But for whatever reason, you've chosen us to get the message out, and that God, that we will give our lives to giving out that message in the name of Jesus. Use us, Lord. Open doors. Father, I pray that just like this, the, the, this woman and the whole story of a case for Christ and Lee Strobel, that God, that you will put times in our lives where the Holy Spirit, you divinely lead us to men and women that we can share the good news with where you are doing something special. Father, we believe in miracles. We believe the anointing of the Holy Spirit for people to be healed, people to be set free, for people to have an encouraging word, a prophetic word, an an exhorting word to come right from you. And so, God, we are your vessels and we say, use us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you for those that are watching. Those that are in the house after service, we always want to give time to pray for those that have a need that like us to pray for. And you at home, if you have a prayer need, you can email us or go to our website and let us know and we will have people that can pray for you. And if you want us to contact you and pray with you over the phone, we will certainly do that as well. So uh, let us know. And so right now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the service. Connect with us at impactto.ca. And don't forget to join our YouTube channel. See you next time.